Of course, everyone wants to write things that matter, and today I'm going to show you the first steps for figuring out how to do it. You know, the life of a rhetorical situation investigator isn't as glamorous as it used to be, but the clients still keep coming in because we provide a valuable service. We help people figure out their persuasive strategy by evaluating the situations that they find themselves in. You see, a wise man once said, it's all about context, and that's true for a lot of things, but it's especially true for anything rhetorical. If you want to be persuasive, you have to understand your context. Get that wrong, and your whole argument will miss the mark. And if that sounds high stakes, it probably is. But the real point is that it's possible to get it right. And you don't need some kind of magical intuition for saying the right thing to make it happen. You just need to pay careful attention to your context. Get that down, and you'll be persuading people in all kinds of situations. So, at the risk of making myself obsolete, I'd like to let you in on some of the tricks of the business and show you how you can figure out what you need to do in any context. And to do it, we'll be taking a few looks at Lloyd Bitzer's essay, The Rhetorical Situation. Unofficially, we RSIs consider it one of our founding documents. So stick around, you might just pick up a thing or two. Whenever a client comes to me with a job, it's always because something has happened, something that's forcing them to get writing. Maybe they need to write a speech about a crisis in the city or issue a public apology for something they did wrong. Maybe they're putting together a cover letter for a job or school application, or just writing a card for a friend who's lost a beloved pet armadillo. It doesn't really matter what that spark is, but every rhetorical situation starts with a spark, something that creates a need for a response. In technical terms, we call that spark the exigence. And Bitzer says that any exigence is an imperfection marked by urgency. That means that there's something wrong, some kind of problem or need that must be addressed in a timely manner. And in practical terms, you see exigences of all sorts. If your submarine springs a leak, you've got a dire exigence. You need to repair that leak. Or if you're the agricultural type and your corn's ripe, there's another exigence. You've got to harvest before it rots on the stock. Of course, these aren't rhetorical exigences. You're not going to patch up a submarine with a speech, but rhetorical exigences work in a similar way. It's just that instead of applying a practical fix, a rhetorical exigence calls for a rhetorical fix. So you got to begin by understanding the nature of your exigence. Is it a ceremonial thing where people just expect you to say nice things about someone? Maybe something terrible has happened and you need to reassure people and outline your plan for how to resolve the problem. Uh, maybe you've had a terrible meal and you just really need to write a scathing review somewhere on the web. Rhetorical exigences are like bumps in the road that get fixed with words. And don't forget that you can use your rhetorical powers to draw people's attention to an exigence. Maybe nobody else thinks that new menu item is a threat to the world economy, so use your rhetorical skills to persuade people that it's an exigence before you try to solve it. The main point here is that every argument needs a reason to exist. So don't go inventing solutions to non-existent problems and don't try to offer a solution to a problem that's already been fixed. You might really like Ike, but the time to vote for him has long passed. And finally, rhetorical exigences call for particular kinds of responses. It's not going to go over very well if you write a fiery attack on someone when you're on the hook to write an apology, just like it wouldn't go very well if you brought a bushel of corn to fix a sinking submarine. So understand the cause for your argument, confirm that your argument actually addresses it, and then make sure that your audience knows what's at stake in the whole thing. So your rhetorical situation revolves around an exigence, that disruption that calls for some kind of a response. But knowing and understanding your audience is just as important as understanding the reason that you're writing in the first place. As Bitzer puts it, since rhetorical discourse produces change by influencing the decision and action of persons who function as mediators of change, it follows that rhetoric always requires an audience. In other words, if you're going to persuade people to do something, you got to have people to persuade. But more than that, you got to pick the people you're addressing pretty carefully. The most common rookie mistake I see is picking an audience that's too broad. And I get it, you want to make a big impact by addressing as many people as possible, but that's rarely the most effective choice. Remember, we're working with a specific exigence and trying to address an urgent rhetorical need that has arisen, so it's not going to work to write to just anyone. You've got a job to do, and your audience should help you to do that job. Most often, you should pick an audience that has the ability to do something about the exigence. So if you think a particular university policy is bad for students, don't waste your time writing an argument aimed at students explaining why it's bad. Because first of all, they probably already know, and secondly, there's not too much that they can do about it. 
Now, writing something to persuade university administrators to change the policy makes a whole lot more sense because they actually have the ability to help you resolve that exigence. Or maybe you're speaking at a funeral. Of course, death is the exigence, broadly speaking, but you're not going to write a speech encouraging the medical community to hurry up with the secrets of immortality. Instead, the real purpose is to remember the deceased and to encourage the grieving to live good, meaningful lives. In that case, you choose your audience not because they can fix your problem, but because your words can fix their problem. So understanding your exigence can help you to pick out your audience more effectively because it will attune you to the people who are most affected by the exigence and help you to see the people who have the greatest ability to do something about it. So don't try to address everyone. Don't address people who are only interested in your topic and don't bother trying to address people who will never agree with you no matter what. Keep your goal in mind and then write for the audience that can help you to accomplish that goal. When you understand your exigence and you've picked out an audience that is closely connected to that exigence, then you just need to figure out what to say and how to say it. And of course, that's the real trick. And in order to figure that out, you need to understand the constraints of the situation that you're in. As Bitzer put it, constraints are made up of persons, events, objects, and relations which are part of the situation because they have the power to constrain decision and action needed to modify the exigence. Standard sources of constraint include beliefs, attitudes, documents, facts, traditions, images, interests, motives, and the like. And when the orator enters the situation, his discourse not only harnesses constraints given by the situation, but provides additional important constraints. Now that's a pretty busy list, but it just points out that while all situations have constraints, every situation will have its own constraints. So you're going to want to put some time into understanding what the constraints in your given situation are. Now, to keep it simple, constraints limit the possibilities of what you can say. Obviously, you can't just go into any situation and say anything and expect it to work. And constraints are useful because they tell you the things that won't work. Constraints can take all forms, but every constraint will help to inform your decisions about how you respond to the exigence. For example, the beliefs and motives of your audience will constrain how you can relate to them. Rookies try to persuade based on their own motives instead of their audiences. If you know what your audience values, then you gotta phrase your argument in those terms so that they'll actually be motivated to do something. Or if you're proposing a law within the United States, the US Constitution offers a pretty significant set of constraints. You just can't effectively propose a law that violates the Constitution. If you want to persuade people to build a new form of space travel, then facts like gravity, propulsion, and orbital mechanics will all constrain your argument. Some things just aren't physically possible, so arguing for them doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And time can be a constraint, or local customs, or the weather, anything. It's impossible to provide a comprehensive list of all possible constraints, but it's important to know that they're out there so that you can look for them. Really, when you have a good handle on the constraints of the ways that you relate to your audience and address your exigence, then you're just not gonna have to waste time with less effective strategies. Well, it's probably time that I got back to brooding in the shadows. But before I go, remember that when you properly understand your rhetorical situation, you have a much higher chance of writing something that will actually work in context. Because it's like Bitzer said, a work of rhetoric is pragmatic. It comes into existence for the sake of something beyond itself. It functions ultimately to produce action or change in the world. It performs some task. So you gotta understand the task you want to accomplish, and then make sure that you actually do it. And you can get a long way by understanding your exigence, learning about your audience, and accounting for all of the possible constraints that may arise in a given situation. It really is all about context, and when you understand that context, you can write things that are way more persuasive. Of course, I'm an RSI, so I investigate these kinds of rhetorical situations all the time. In fact, I've already told you the story of how I helped one person write an email to their professor. And there's no limit to these kinds of rhetorical situations that we're equipped to deal with. I've got lots of other stories to tell, so if there's a particular rhetorical situation you'd like to know more about, just let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can remember. Anyhow, you've taken your first steps towards becoming an RSI in your own right. And frankly, I'd be kind of proud of you if I weren't so hard-boiled. You know, just don't get too good at figuring this stuff out or I might be out of a job. Okay, I really do have to go stare out a window into the night now, so we'll catch up later but thanks for sticking around and take it easy.